Welcome to NYJC's Hashtag National Youth Jazz Wednesday. I'm thrilled that the guest that we're talking to today is a very dear friend of ours, Laura Judd, award-winning trumpet player, composer, band leader, educator, and a fabulous person all around. Welcome, Laura. Lovely to see you. Yeah, hello. Nice to be here. <laughs> and it's um, actually not the first time we've seen each other online today because we've, we've been doing some online teaching. How, have you, how are you enjoying the online world of education? It's true. It's um, yeah, it's been mad. I mean, we've had a fair few weeks now to get used to this. I've been sort of teaching online since the very beginning of lockdown. And yeah, it's, it's interesting. I do quite a lot of composition teaching. So in a way that it's, you know, not having to play instruments so much, it's been, yeah, it's been fairly manageable and, and productive. And it's been very interesting doing NYJC teaching you know, like a group of musicians, you know, thinking about how you might talk about ensemble playing in a situation where everyone has to play individually. So but I actually have had fun. And today was, um, yeah, it was good today, I thought. Yeah. Well, I know that uh, from the youngsters that we work with, I know that they're always intrigued to know about the next generation up and how their journey began. <laughs> and, uh, and often people wonder, what was your first instrument? Yeah, so my first instrument, I feel very fortunate to say, was the piano. Um, I started having piano lessons very young, like about five or something like that. And I was kind of too young to have lessons, really. I used to have these little 15 minutes on the floor with my piano teacher. I say on the floor, it will be explained, but we used to play little games and I used to learn about rhythms and stuff. Um, yeah, on the floor and then maybe play a little bit of piano, but, you know, just for as long as the attention span of a five year old allows. And then, yeah, I suppose as I got a little bit older, half an hour was possible. And um, but I feel, yeah, and that same teacher actually taught me right the way to the age of 18, um, wow. doing classical piano a lot of the time. But they also they were a fantastic classical pianist, but they, yeah, recognised that I love to improvise and they were also into all kinds of music. So they love jazz music as well, even though they weren't a jazz pianist um, in terms of their specialism. But yeah, they kind of taught me about chords and reading chord symbols and um, yeah, improvising got me kind of, because they recognize that's something I really enjoy doing. They sort of, uh, yeah, zoomed in on that as well as learning, you know, my Mozart and Beethoven and Bach and all this kind of stuff. But so it was a really, yeah, lots of stuff coming in at an early age, which I'm very grateful for. And when when you looked and heard all that stuff, did it feel compartmentalised? Were you aware of the fact that there was notated and improvised, that there was classical, there was jazz? Or was it, I'm not going to answer the question for you, I'll dot, dot, dot. What, yeah, what I think mean? so, maybe. Yeah. I think so. I And I suppose when you're playing, when you're a beginner on the piano, you don't really, you're learning beginner piano music, which isn't necessarily like, part of the classical you don't like delve into the classical repertoire of piano until you're a bit you know more advanced so um yeah I, I just used I remember when I was like at primary school I always just loved playing pieces that sounded jazzy to me or rhythmic in some way I would just always like that and I funnily enough used to feel like oh, I don't want to play the classical music I want to I want to make stuff up and play jazz and it wasn't until later on that I actually realized that classical music was really awesome too you know um but when I was really little I just wanted to play groovy stuff and you know play around so and was that was that groovy stuff around you at home were people, other people how did you discover the groovy stuff um I think yeah my parents like music they're not uh, musicians themselves but um I suppose even just like where you find music in everyday places in everyday households like on the tv on the radio like just little ditties you know I you know even if it was all just quite incidental and stuff like that like music was clearly something that I found very exciting so I would just yeah without really thinking too much about what it was or where it came from I would try and like copy little things I'd heard on the tv on the piano and stuff like that so I was using my ears to work out music at a quite a young age you know which obviously is a great training to be a jazz musician you know um, and then it wasn't until later on when I started joining I suppose little youth ensembles and you start to 
you know, playing music written by, you know, I guess you start off playing music written by composers who specifically write for young people. And I actually think it's, yeah, it's really great when you find, because there's so much music out there for young musicians and, and beginners, but yeah, there's a real art to creating a great bit of music for a beginner musician. And I think it's, uh, yeah, and I think lots of people we know do that really well, write music for young people that is really exciting and engaging. And as I got, as I went through my school years, I was introduced to more of that. And then to more kind of, yeah, music that's part of the jazz tradition. When I started to join um, a jazz, I, I joined like a county youth jazz orchestra. Many counties have these like, uh, youth ensembles and I had a jazz orchestra where I lived and yeah so when I joined there the sort of tutors there introduced me to various musicians and I started to buy albums and check stuff out and it all just snowballs really from this point. Um, so are there specific musicians now that are sort of in that back catalogue of inspiration? Yeah, I suppose so. I mean, there's so much music that I love. It's it, it's actually quite nice when someone asks you to distill like this all this stuff into like a few different composers or moments or pieces. And it, it the answer, you know, depending on how that question is asked, it, it kind of changes. But you know, if I was to specify the question when it comes to say um, uh, like jazz musicians that have really resonated with me and stuck with me definitely someone who was perhaps the yeah the first album I bought was by it sounds quite cliche it was by Miles Davis um and yeah he's that jazz musician that loads of people have heard of he's like a pop kind of icon isn't he he's just like a he's a bit of a sort of cultural icon which is quite incredible but yeah. um yeah he also happens to be I, I absolutely love the way he plays the trumpet and also just the way he uh was he just made a lot of albums which I like I like that because I, I find making albums really fun too and maybe it's because I listen to like artists like Miles who have done a lot of that also someone like Bill Frizzell has made loads of albums of like loads of different music and I I really yeah I just think that's cool because I also find it really fun so it's nice to know that you know that's something that other people do you know as well and what, what did you do with the inspiration? Was it as an audience or did you start to play along and trying to sort of work out what was going on in the, in the sort of the secondary school kind of sort of era? In the secondary school era, yeah. I think I would maybe listen a lot. I don't think I necessarily played along until a bit later and maybe somebody told me that would be a good idea maybe a teacher of mine said that told me it'd be a cool thing to learn someone solo or to play along with a band and I mean maybe I did do it a little bit it's hard to remember but I even just think in a funny way I played along in my head as I was listening a lot I think as a trumpet player you because of the nature of the instrument and how it works you have to have quite good ears to be able to you have to hear the notes and be able to sing them before you can play them yeah. so in that sense a lot of my jazz practice if you like sort of melodic harmonic kind of practice is sort of just when I'm milling around and I mean I obviously have practiced a lot on my instrument but it's yeah I think I would have listened to those records and I would have just noticed even if I didn't know what they were called like in formally like harmonically like certain movements or something even if I didn't know what they were called I'd probably like hear a kind of movement and at least be able to sing the music and then it was like working out um, how to put it on the instrument and there was a few light bulb moments for me in terms of that but you know maybe that'll come later because <laughs> um, I'm presuming at this point as you're listening to all of these artists I was already presuming that you're playing trumpet but I don't know if that was the case when, what, when did you start to play the trumpet yeah so I it actually wasn't long after I started learning piano it was a few years after um a lady called Jane Bryden, who is a very cool woman who is who's taught for Hampshire Music Service for many, many years. I think she's just retiring. She came in to do group brass lessons at my primary school. Um, mm. And uh, yeah, I, I was quite keen to do this. I wasn't so like I'd never thought like had a particular vested in, in interest in the trumpet itself, but the opportunity arose and 
um, I also had an uncle who had a trumpet sort of sitting in his house somewhere gathering dust that he played, you know, maybe a long time ago. He hasn't played it for a long time, but um, yeah, rather than it gathering dust, it, it felt like a good, it, a good home for it would be um, in my hands in my primary school brass lesson. So that was very nice because obviously there is a sort of financial commitment for a family when someone starts an instrument, learning an instrument, you know, often music services, you know, I know some of them are able to loan instruments and things like that temporarily. But yeah, I, we didn't have to make that kind of decision because there just was one floating about in one of my uncle's houses. So um, I remember what it felt like playing it for the first time or for the first few times. Just kind of like a bit weird, I think, because trumpet is strange, like it's a it's a mad like the technique of it is quite mad like how you make a note and I think I was a bit rubbish for a while but I was in a group you know like in group lessons are interesting because the teacher is having to like le like teach le like take care of everyone but there'll be some people that are better and some people that are strong but the cool thing about when I was learning I already I knew what a crotch it was and a quaver or you know what syncopation felt like and I knew what you know how to sing things and so I didn't all I had to worry about was learning the technique at this point because the music bit I had a head start so that was I was lucky in that sense you know and, and were you industrious industrious what does that mean like you, did you apply yourself and were you sort of regular in the way that you practiced oh yeah or were oh. you sort of like oh um I, I seem to have discovered that I've got some talent and that that talent for a while can carry me yeah, I mean, you'll be pleased to know that my uh, perhaps my focus on music has got in the way of my learning of the English language and my vocabulary, hence my uh, question. Um, yeah, I've been thinking about music too much and forgetting to learn <laughs> basic Good, words. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I did actually, I enjoyed it. And I think my at the beginning stage, it's hard to remember, but I'm sure when I was at primary school, I didn't practice loads and loads. It was probably something that I had a bit of fun with and it was more just a hobby and like at that age kids should just be allowed to just play and have fun so it was less intense but I think I probably towards the like end of primary school I was like aware that I was really into it and I liked practicing and then when I went to secondary school I realized that in order to progress on an instrument you you know you do have to put these hours in and I I think the fact that I wanted to be able to play an instrument really well was enough of a motivation for yeah. me because I recognised how fun it would be if I could, you know, play this piece or if I could do this. So it was never a chore. I mean, it, it feels like a chore in a way because a lot of practice is very kind of kind of sporting like in a way and very technical. It's not all just playing whimsically, playing lovely tunes and but I, you know, if that's the means to a very exciting, creative end, then that's a cool thing, you know. And actually, I've actually found the joy in that kind of, you know, the meditative nature of picking up the trumpet every morning and playing long notes. I find a lot of, um, it's a very grounding thing to do. And it's a very, it really helps your focus. And just, I'm very, for, I feel very grateful to have something to practice in my life you know it's it's brilliant it teaches you a lot about loads of stuff and when you were talking earlier on you, you were very early on in the conversation as well as in your formative years you were saying you know I, was, I found it exciting and I think that excitement informs your inquisitiveness and then that inquisitiveness is what's led you to be when you have been industrious That's yeah been <laughs> what, you can see the end what, what the goal is you're trying to achieve through your through sort of applying yourself whether it's as a composer or a yeah and I, yeah. I think that from a educator's perspective and having seen you work with the young musicians I think that comes across really clearly in the way that you teach as well oh you great not doing it just for the sake of a checklist but you can see what makes the young musicians and where they're at and so what is it how might I feed that you know inquisitive mm. and that enthusiasm and yeah I mean that's lovely to hear because I I think one of the reasons that I love to teach and why I feel like it's a important part of who I am, I suppose, is I, I was just so lucky to have like insanely brilliant music teachers at my schools. And I just went to regular state schools. 
I just suppose I grew up in an area which had some really nice ones, like some really good ones and good music departments and really great music teachers that went beyond, you know, ticking the boxes of the secondary school music syllabus, but actually loved music and wanted to do loads of cool stuff. And so all along the way, I, you know, they've just all been brilliant. And they actually got me so, yeah, it's that very thing, got me so excited about music that I absolutely wanted to know what that cool sound was or that amazing, like why that rhythm feels so groovy and, you know, who's that composer? All these questions arose naturally. So, yeah. And Hampshire sounds like it was a really great county to to be in. Like you say, the provision sounds great. And particularly from my knowledge of you, because I came to meet you at, when you were 16. So I, I was yeah. aware of um, Alton College and that seems to have been quite a strong um, yeah it, it was fun it really was it's the best um the best delivery of the music of charles mingus i've ever experienced so good like no like alton college jazz band amongst those who know is quite leg legendary or well, anyone who's been inside it it's quite legendary and it's you know if you grew up in the area and you're into music you might make a you, you might make a choice to travel a very long way to get to that college to be in that jazz band you know I was lucky I lived 10 10 minutes drive away but um but a lot of people traveled far and wide to be in that jazz band and we used to play a lot actually like the, the head of uh music there he's sadly not with us anymore a fantastic um composer called Martin Reed who was into an astonishing amount of music in a very deep way um I wouldn't call him a jazz musician, but he certainly loved jazz and knew how it felt. But he um, he's a composer. He wrote lots of like um, operas and things like that. But he, um, yeah, he just ensured that it didn't really feel, it often just felt like a, didn't feel like a college thing. And I was quite lucky that my sixth form college was a separate, it was kind of really felt like I'd finished school by that point because it was a separate, um, what do you call it, further education college. Yeah. So you get to wear your own clothes and call your teachers by their first name and you just feel like, oh, cool, well, that school stuff's over now. I was really, and by that point, I was so happy for that to be the case. I was like, just wanted to play music. And um, yeah, we used to play in like pub gardens at Fates and you know, quite a rural area, so lots of fates and things going on. And uh, we played at Swanage Jazz Festival every year, which was quite far from where I lived. But we used to take a big, people used to share lifts or take a coach. I don't know. I can't remember. But um, yeah, it was, really, it, was, it was amazing. Yeah. And when you say traveling long distances as well, I think it wasn't just the young, young musicians that traveled to study there. But I know that some of the tutors that you studied with traveled quite a long way to come and teach you all as well. It's true. Yeah. So in fact, that's a really good point because, yeah, whilst I was there, I um, once a week and this was all set up by Martin um, once a week, every Wednesday afternoon, the entire afternoon was dedicated to playing jazz in a small group setting. And you had to do I think I was I was the first year that they tried. They piloted it and it wasn't an official when I did it, it wasn't an official qualification. But I think the idea was that they would make it one and the brilliant. I was really lucky that it wasn't because it was open and there was no bureaucracy to ruin it, you know, but um, <laughs> that's, what, that's what I think. But um, yeah, so Mick Foster, who is obviously a, a tutor at NYJC, wonderful saxophone player, Mick Foster used to come down from yeah, his home in South End and uh, all that way to Alton College to spend the Wednesday afternoon with us, which was just totally cool. Um, and uh, yeah, he definitely shined a light on a lot of uh, jazz specifics. I wouldn't have, uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't have had the good fortune of knowing more about, you know, um, without that experience. So it was and brilliant. And we did lots of little gigs again in different areas, different like parts of the local area. So it was pretty luxurious. It was like being sort of part of a conservatoire jazz course in a way before you've you've got there. It was like a little taste. And were you, because I seem to remember you were band leading a bit then as well. <laughs> yeah, I probably was. It's funny. I as well, maybe. Uh, yeah, I suppose I was. It, it's quite oh. funny. I've always sort of uh, just like enjoyed playing live music and 
mm-hmm. you know, and playing in bands and setting up spaces for bands to play. So, yeah, I think when I was actually in my latter half of secondary school, set up a little band with my mates, we weren't so good at like proper jazz. We used to play like quite a lot of kind of maybe what you would call like jazz rock or something you know like all the typical things chameleon watermelon man herbie hancock classics you know and um mainly because you i just hadn't met a drummer that could play swing feel yet you know so or a bassist that knew how to play a walking bass but then you then you meet mick foster and he teaches your mates how to do that so that's cool um and then, yeah, I, I just had the good fortune of meeting a couple of other young musicians who were really into it too. So we used to play a lot together and learn a lot from each other. And, yeah. And then we met, as I said, 20, 2007. So from the very conception of uh, NYJC, you've been yeah. an integral part of its story. So how did you come to hear about NYJC? Um, I think it was because that was the summer before I went to sixth form college. I think that there was like a leaflet in my secondary school music department, like a little flyer, which just goes to show that flyers do work. It's not all about the internet. Flyers are good. People like to see a flyer. So I saw a flyer um, and maybe my music teachers saw what it said, you know, the classroom music teachers and thought, oh, this would be great for Laura, you know, or whatever. And then, yeah, I, I seem to remember I auditioned for NYJC all the way up in Birmingham because I couldn't make the London audition. <laughs> um, so I was obviously keen because I travelled all the way to Birmingham for the audition. <laughs> so after that, then you went, to, we'll, we'll talk about NYJC in a minute because I think it'd be really nice to sort of have both aspects at the same time rather than do everything chronologically, sort of talking about anything that you remember as a student, but also more importantly, what you're doing as one of the tutors but there's still more to your journey which is then you went to study at Trinity and I know that was a big influence and then during that time also we're performing starting to write a lot and we we worked together a lot while we were there on composition and you were really you know you sort of your the scope of the music that you were playing was really broadening that was quite a powerful journey so I wondered whether you might share some of that with us yeah I guess in a way that all started with I just mentioned Martin Reed he was a fantastic composer and I started having I knew I liked to write music but from that point I'd just written a few little like tunes maybe for a jazz band to play or whatever but I I knew I wanted to have sort of composition lessons and there was some sort of scheme I think in Hampshire Music Service where you could get like apply to get extra lessons than you would ordinarily get with your A-levels or something. So as as you do, if you're a music enthusiast, you're enthusiast, (laughs) you um, apply for everything you can to help you learn music. So um, yeah, I got these extra lessons with Martin, one-to-one composition lessons, which was really cool because it was very separate to my A-level studies. and it was just about developing my skills at writing music. So he would set me all these cool um, exercises. Um, There's a cool exercise I remember, which I just I just remember enjoying it. It was this um, piece by Thomas Tallis, the great British choral composer, who's buried here in Greenwich, somewhere out there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, but he, it was like, I had to like, it was like the first bar or something of some Thomas Tallis, or the first couple of bars, and then I had to like, we like looked at how that music worked and I like had to continue as if I was Thomas, you know, and, and, and sort of, which was fun because all that Renaissance music is so full of such kind of wild things. There's a lot of wild things that goes on, which was, they they were all perhaps tidied up by the time we got into the Baroque era a little bit. But um, so it was really fun to like, he, he would give me these little goals, like, Oh, see if you can make this happen in, this bar or see if we you know and so I and all kinds of things and I I wrote all all sorts of stuff and I was learning so much about like different classical composers I was beginning to really get a real find out who the composers I really love were and he he would know a lot about stuff so I would be able to ask him you know oh like if I'm going to listen to um you know 
Stravinsky what what pieces should look what's your favorite ballet what's what's his coolest chamber music and all, all this stuff so I used to find yeah I used to he was just an endless source of information and he continued to be so when I went to Trinity and I think I suppose at Trinity I was very keen to continue that compositional journey while studying to be a like jazz jazz trumpet which is the course that I did at Trinity but I kind of um yeah it was I was fortunate to have a lot of one-to-one lessons in composition whilst I was at Trinity as you know because you were my teacher for um a time at Trinity and you you would have seen the kind of yeah I suppose I was just working out how to I still am actually and I always will I suppose that's the fun bit of it but how do I what can I express having all these things that I love you know what is it that I can blurt out artistically with all this stuff floating around in my head so what um, triggers all of that creativity so for, like when you sit down and write a piece for example what, where might it have come from what stimulated it um I think it varies it's a lot clearer and that, that the answer to that question might be a little bit clearer to me now than it might have been then like when I first started at Trinity a lot of my composition felt like this real struggle or something like I really struggled because I think I had in my head like I had this sort of idea of what a good composer should be able to do mm-hmm. and I used to um sort of I suppose yeah it was just sort of a big struggle the word composer for me comes with such gravitas somehow just culturally to say you're a composer it's like first of all it sounds quite posh doesn't it like to say you're a composer and and knowing what a composer could do having listened to like amazing music by I don't know I'm going to say Stravinsky again because he's my favorite composer but um I I just was thinking like whoa I'm gonna if I if I want to go and come close to that I'm really gonna have to like get it together in so many ways so I, there was all this pressure I used to put on myself but actually it was probably good for me in some ways but I've developed a much more positive relationship with the creative <laughs> process um I've always loved it obviously but yeah. it's less of a it can be a slog now but now at least I understand why and I've probably embraced my I've worked out a, a my I've honed some essential skills and I've sort of um, uh, yeah oh I don't know I've just grown up I suppose you just work stuff out it's really hard to say but um also like sometimes depending on what I'm writing there'll be a different focus so like my most recent actually not the like one of the most recent things that I've written is music for my band Dinosaur and they were just jazz tunes but they're the first time in my life actually I've ever written tunes which you could fit on an A4 sheet of paper and they're like just tunes and chord symbols that was really fun for me too because I spent so long playing that sort of music it's really cool to write that music Um, and it's kind of weird that I hadn't done that yet actually I had a couple of times but not like the the professional me had never done that um if you get what I mean yeah and um that was fun and sometimes that feels less like being a composer and more just like um feels like a very in the moment thing actually weirdly enough because these tunes particularly were very simple they didn't need much they 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 just sort of invited themselves into my house (laughs) if you get what I mean um whereas other times like a couple I suppose the biggest like meaty chunky composition I've done recently is I, I made this album last year called Stepping Back Jumping In which was for this 14 piece ensemble, mixed ensemble of different noisy people. And that was much more like, okay, I I, I actually put that together because I was really keen to sort of, uh, yeah, like give my composition chops a workout, actually. That's the only reason I did it. Well, not the only reason, but so I, I was excited to get really stuck into all the textural possibilities and the structural possibilities and the, yeah, but I suppose one of the things is that there's always, more often than not, an improviser, at least one, in a lot of the music I write, if not 
all improvisers. So that's an interesting thing, like uh, writing for specific people as opposed to instruments. I think that's actually why the recent dinosaur music felt like it just made itself because I've been playing with these people who I was writing for for like, like yeah, 10 years now. So yeah. They, they, they're, they're moving my hand on the manuscript. <laughs> That's a lovely way of putting it. Because, yeah, working with people that you already know is, is a, a great way of that sort of ebb and flow between composition and improvisation on the spectrum. And you can anticipate what people, how they're going to respond. You start to get to know them. You know how they're going to respond and you draw on that often. I think we all do that with musicians that we work with regularly. But to say that they're actually there guiding your hand, I love that description. That's yeah. beautiful. I actually weirdly sometimes do this when I improvise as well. But some this sound, um, yeah, this sounds a bit strange, but sometimes I try and like channel somebody. <laughs> like sometimes I will start writing, so it could be like a with this dinosaur music, I can talk about that most vividly because I remember it because it was recent. But this this recent dinosaur music, I'd like I've made this like bass line or whatever. And I'll I just I'll know what kind of world I want the melody to inhabit, but I and and knowing that what world might come from like a certain person. It might be like this one track where I definitely was imagining like sort of a flowery folky melody of the likes of someone like Hugh Warren you know and I, I would genuinely like think about that person's music in quite a yeah I almost feel like they're they've helped me write it as I'm writing it you know yeah. or I and I always actually when I play trumpet so often it's a bit creepy actually the amount of times I do it but I like channel the trumpet player Chris Batchelor so much because I just think everything he plays is the best. I love it so much. And and he's just got this way of saying the perfect amount of things. And and he he never, I never know what he's going to play. I love that, you know, because some people you kind of, some people are really cool players and you know, you kind of know what they're going to play and you know you're going to enjoy it and that's cool. But something about Chris is like, not quite sure what he's going to do. And I, I really like that. Um, so I often try and channel, channel, channel the batch every time I put a trumpet to my mouth. Like that. <laughs> I think that's, and that's what people advocate, isn't it, within the sort of the, the realms of improvisation is to, sort of, is to focus on people whose music you like, because you're going to be spending a very long time in that relationship as you're learning it, not just even meeting them and playing with them. And, and I think mimicry is the best form of flattery. And then that can evolve beyond, which it definitely has between you and Chris, because you're such good colleagues and you work together and you've done projects together. And I know he holds you in high regard, as do all of the musicians that we've talked about that you've studied with. And I was wondering what that spectrum of composition and improvisation as well, do you see yourself as two devolved roles or when you write and then you play a piece you've written, does your improvisation, is it mindful of what you were thinking as a composer? And the other way around, have you ever done anything that started through improvisation that you've been mindful of as you've crafted it into an end product yeah I'm just thinking um I think I'm gonna answer this slowly to give me thinking time because it's all about pacing <laughs> um I think the answer to that question is that I think about it very separately which might be a bit of a scandalous answer I think it might be. I'll change my mind tomorrow. But um, I think it's separate in the sense that, like, I never use my trumpet to compose because I always find that I find things difficult. I'm like, oh, I've written this for myself and the trumpet's in this key. Why couldn't I write it in, you know, B flat? I've written it in F sharp or I've written it in E major. Um, and I just. Yeah, so I really, and I often feel like when I finished a composition that I didn't write the piece, someone else did. You know, I feel quite detached yeah. from them. So I quite like experiencing the compositions as like a musician who's seeing them for the first time and then working out. Because I'm kind of, as I'm writing it, I'm not so, like, I don't think about what it might feel like massively to improvise on it I suppose I do I must do because if I was writing a space for myself to improvise 
you know, I would give it thought, but I suppose I wouldn't give too much thought to like, you know, is it going to be tricky or is it going to be easy? It would be more about um, what kind of sound, to, what kind of, what kind of musical zone do we want to enter? Mm-hmm. You know, so I don't know. And, and maybe the playful, I think all composers probably do this in some ways, but I suppose when you're playing around with music, you're improvising. And that sometimes generates ideas. Um, so, yeah, and, and that, the, the barriers, I think, arrive when you rush that process. You know, when you try and mm-hmm. if you spend an hour, you know, composing. <laughs> you know, I'm going to start composing now. And this is a bit of a strange thing because, um, yeah, sometimes you feel like, oh, by the end of this hour, I should have some stuff that I've created that's going to be permanent. But actually, that can be quite a pressure. And I think it's fun to just, Mm. yeah, like take away all that. I suppose these are the kind of skills you learn the more you do something. And like anything like practicing an instrument, you have to practice composing to arrive at, like work this stuff out. But um, yeah, definitely play around when I'm starting to like think about ideas. And I suppose my skills as an improviser must influence that somehow. I don't know. No, I agree with, you, with the playing around. You know, often I'll write a piece where I'll spend quite a lot of time, a lot of time just forming the character, the little personality that's going to be in it, taking it for a little walk through different sort of psychological moods. And I might not even use any of that in my piece, but it's kind of I've been getting to know it's a bit like sort of the way that um, Mike Lee works, you know, as a, a script writer, that you sort of want to get into the moods and the personality, but I don't ever feel that it, I'm throwing anything away. If I don't use something, it was part of the process and definitely with you. Sometimes very quickly something will come out, but definitely not necessarily feel obliged to the minute you sit down. And that's great. That, and that seems to tap in what you said to your still, your playful inquisitiveness of, of one, and not being in, like you say, not being in a hurry. So I don't think, and the, that comes out very clear in the way that you play as well. You, you're not in a hurry. You don't put okay. yourself under pressure. How do you yeah. cope with the pressures of being, because people around you can sometimes create pressure and the work <laughs> regime could be quite full of pressure. Are you mindful about allowing yourself that space and making sure you've got that space and not feel pressure? Yeah, I mean, I certainly recognise when I do... I mean, I love playing music so much, like, and I, I, I put, yeah, like I, my expectations for having a musical experience are so high, actually, probably unhealthily high, I'm going to say, I'm going to self-reflect and say it's unhealthily high. And that can sometimes result in, um, like, I get really disappointed if I have a tough time playing music, actually. To the point that I can probably be quite an unpleasant person to be around if that's the case. Um, and I, because I, and the reason for that is, is I love playing so much. And sometimes a lot of that is often to do with not, I'm happy to say, nothing artistic. It's often to do with finding my instrument difficult to play. Because um, obviously we've talked about loosely about technical things on the trumpet um, and how, you know, as an instrument, it has its like quite significant technical challenges. And actually, I'm pleased to say that in terms of consistency, I've I think over the last few years I've worked out um yeah I am a lot more consistent and I've definitely because when I first left college I was having real um as some a lot of people maybe don't realize it may come as some surprise to some people but I I I was having a lot of problems technically on my instrument and I was also doing lots of gigs and you can't solve a lot of a lot of these in order to find solutions to these technical problems you need a bit of time and space out of playing and I was kind of having to play a lot and I was I wasn't I wasn't I didn't know how to fix the problems anyway and I was trying to do a lot of it on my own just these annoying technical things um and eventually I went and had some lessons with people that really really helped and I got back to a place and I think a lot of the things arose from trying to make lots of silly noises on the trumpet and it ruined my technique um <laughs> it ruined me um, whereas before I used to just never do that so it was not an issue but um yeah I but also through that struggle I learned to like try and have fun and deal with whatever you have that day so 
as well as becoming more technically flexible, I've also, I'm also much more at peace with like, okay, if I have to improvise and I've got an octave and a half, then I've got an octave and a half and I'm going to try and have fun with it. I suppose it was a bit sad. That's harder when you don't even feel like you can make a sound that you like. That that made me so sad. Yeah. And I couldn't, I like, I just, and I used to, I did even sometimes just, I've wanted to just go and play loads of right hand piano solos because I'm all right at piano. And I just thought maybe I should do that because you know, <laughs> I, the, imp the music's all there. I just can't get it through this silly brass machine that I've decided to become a professional at. <laughs> also, that, that's everybody at every stage that leads up to being a professional. All the youngsters that we work with are also going through those frustrations which is oh, great that yeah. you're so empathetic you know and I think it's I think we as practitioners should remind ourselves from time to time by actually playing on a second instrument or even a new instrument that we've never played so yeah. that we've got that musicianship but how do we do it through an instrument that we haven't mastered yet just to remind ourselves yeah. of what it feels like to be you know a three year or a grade three rather trumpet player trying to play like they want to be playing and haven't yet reach that point yeah wondering about your about uh, dinosaur and the new album that you've you released it a couple of weeks ago mid was it mid may a couple of weeks ago mid may yeah that's Edition. right so uh, we've got a group four musicians the regular lineup that dinosaur has remained the same you said 10 years old now yeah yeah so why those four particular you know obviously yourself why the three particular players that you've asked to be in that band yeah well i suppose um I've known Connor since sixth form, actually, Connor, the bass player, Connor Chaplin, he went to Alton College, which we talked about earlier, and he joined, I was in my second year of sixth form, and he was in his first, so he's an amazing bass player, so I had this, you know, having this person to play with from that point was so wonderful for me, and he's an amazing saxophone player, actually, as well, he doesn't play it so much anymore, but just totally great improviser and amazing ears like such he's a bit of a sponge when it comes to music um and so we'd already had that kind of relationship and um and then yeah at trinity i met elliot galvin and cory dick El elliot the first year i because he was in my year and cory dick the second year he came he was the year below me same with connor who ended up going to trinity as well which was cool for me because i already knew him but yeah um yeah, I just suppose I could speak individually about the two of them. I suppose Elliot was amazing because he also just, yeah, similarly to me, was really interested in composing and had, we had a lot of um, sort of composers that we both loved in common, both from the classical side of things and jazz side of things and just like general artistic interests. There was a lot of um, crossover um, and yeah, just his in inventiveness and just like improvises like a duck to water thing, you know, just like improvising is just, he's never learned to do it. He is an improviser. Like he's just an improviser. And that, that's, that's so, you know, inspiring just that you could just switch that thing on, you know? And um, so, yeah, we, we would do a lot of jazz playing together at college and also a lot of like free improvisation and um, which was, cool he's probably the first person I've done a, like a lot of that like with like playing free music and so that was really exciting and then Corey Dick who arrived in the second year so he was in first year when I was in second year um yeah just yeah amazing like we've all grown a lot together um but one of the things that's always remained about Corey just it's just like amazing feel that like um I've never met anyone like him as a person and his time feel is like no other, actually. It's so interesting. And I'm not even going to use the word, if, if he ever watches this, he'll probably find this funny, but I'm not even going to use the word brilliant because it's not about like metronomic accuracy at all. Like it's about how, like, if you have two notes next to each other, there's like this space in between. And somehow some people can make that feel really magical. And it's not about how even it is. It's just about, it's just sort of innate sort of 
magic and I can't, I can't yeah I just can't really describe it and I guess that's the lovely thing about it because that's why music's good because we we don't need to describe it because it just feels it's something we can just experience but um yeah and I actually feel like there's a commonality like I love the relationship between trumpet and drums a lot because of the articulate like, trumpet can be so articulate but out of all human beings on the planet I, that I've played music with in terms of like occupying a rhythmic space, I feel so connected to Corey. It's quite, yeah, it's quite cool. Yeah, it's good. And he make, he's just, yeah, such a lovely sound. And he's beyond a drummer. He's a fantastic musician that just happens to play the drums. But yeah, and he, he's amazing. He's a bit of a dark horse as well with like composing. And yeah, he's he, he knows a few things. <laughs> it feels like, you can hear it in the music everybody's equally committed to the band so they're not your side people at all this is dinosaur it's great that you came up with a band name so there's a real identity where did dinosaur come from yeah i mean we were like we we're talking about the 10 years thing we've been playing as a group for 10 years but only had the name dinosaur for when from when we released our first album um because we were just playing as the Laura Jerd Quartet. I mean, it's an interesting one. I think at that time it felt like a felt like something I wanted to do. Um, perhaps a lot of artists that I admire admired in certain ways also had bands where it was just like a band name, and I quite like the way that that yeah, like you say, really highlights a band as opposed to an individual. And I actually know that. Um, <laughs> It's silly, but I, I, a lot of people don't realise that I write all the music for Dinosaur. A lot of people think that we maybe write it together. And I don't mind because I actually just told you that actually secretly they do. They just come into my psyche and write it with me. But um, <laughs> I and yeah, a lot of people don't realise that, I suppose, because we play as a band. And that's in a way a compliment because maybe we sound like we've been playing together for some time. But um, yeah, the name, I, I actually just... Or like people ask me this all the time I'm afraid it's not a really good story but you know bear with it's just the fact that I, I actually always imagine one day having a certain type of band called dinosaur I just think it sounds good like dinosaur you know the magic three three syllables just cool and whilst I've never had a massive obsession with dinosaurs I do like them and I think it's, I just, it just felt like a band name, you know, something. Right. Oh, yeah, I, remember I hate the way there's not a big answer to that, but it just feels cool. <laughs> I remember the first time you mentioned it to me and it was with that same thing. It was very definite, but it was, there was no obsessiveness behind it. There was a, I'm just, I'm going to form a band and I'm going to call it Dinosaur. And it was just, yeah, yeah that's what you're going to call it. Yeah. What, what um, would how would you feel if one of the band members turned up with a tune and said could we add this to what we're doing yeah i don't know i feel like <laughs> it sounds a bit weird but in a way it's so um clear that mm -hmm. the way it works is just like i write tunes and we play them and and because everybody else is in so many things and like um of the i'm um, Connor is probably a really killer composer as well, but he doesn't, um, he plays bass so much in so many people's bands that he probably doesn't have the time to write a tune. I bet he could write a really cool one though. Um, but uh, yeah, Corey writes his own music. So he has an outlet for his own creativity mm -hmm. and I'm um, yeah, happy to be a part of that often as well. And Elliot has a trio and he writes, you know, so because they've all, we've all got our sort of spaces, there's a nice clarity to like, okay, when we're going to go into like, um, we're deep, knee deep into the Cory zone, it's his band, you know? Yeah. And, so and, and I, yeah, I, I quite like the fact that there's no mess when it's like, um, this is a little small band reflection of Laura rather than of Elliot and Cory. But Elliot and Cory and Connor are a big part of Laura's life and, world and mind so they're they're in there somehow too but it's like yeah dinosaur is like yeah my little expression of life via small band jazz <laughs> brilliant i love that description and also the way you've just talked about the fact you know well actually in the, it, we do already but we just give it's in different formats we are all a really important integral part of the of the bigger picture for each other 
and so yeah. and so then with because that comes back to the composing as well I was thinking with your having those particular musicians and that identity of the group um how do you feel when you're writing for that particular lineup maybe compared to something that's not so familiar do you, does it get does it give you any advantages, any release? Well, the big advantages I do have, and I feel this, is that I could do most things and they would be fine with it. <laughs> you know, they're so open-minded and they've got such vast knowledge of different worlds and a love of different worlds as well that, you know, that I could... And a commitment to music, actually, and a commitment to being a band that is really strong. Like, we all, like, it's not, it's a profession, and that's almost like a perk. It's like we're all up for, like, bunking down for, you know, hours and hours and memorising music and not earning any money from it, but just there's, that's because it's beyond a, you know, profession. And in a way, as a result of that, yeah when you're playing a gig it's going to be more special you know if you obviously certain I, I think this doesn't apply to all music but certain music is so easy to get rid of the music stands and I think that's such a cool thing if if there if a band can do that I think that's that's really great this is easy to do with the music we're playing at the moment because it's very it's not much information to remember but we've done it with music where there's quite a lot of information and we've even We've had rehearsals where we're like, okay, so we're gonna we're gonna memorize as a group. We're all gonna memorize bars one to six. Okay, let's have a little. Then we play, and then we'll just loop it, loop it, and then okay, we'll add we'll add two bars on, and then we'll loop eight bars. So it's like this sort of working together in this really thorough, rigorous way, which is I feel so fortunate they're invested enough in the art of music making to give that time to something I've made it's very cool you know I feel very lucky you know for that and when you write your music are you thinking that's because you've done that several times now and it's paid off and it's given you that freedom that liberation that depth of uh, within the music is that an end to is that what you aspire to do as you start writing a piece that that's the way I'd like it to end or is it do you just I think it's nice to know that whatever I write it will be the, the mm. delivery will be of like the most magical, you know, standard from there, from their end. And like, I'm writing a little bit of music slowly, like slowly beavering away at, you know, dipping into something at the moment every now and then I've no sort of deadline with it, but I'm imagining it's quite likely that this new music I'm writing will be a bit more structurally kind of surprising with, you know, there's a bit more going on and it will be, quite a feat to memorize but I feel like everyone involved is going to be well up for it yes um, and it'll be fun to me and you start to know they also obviously get to know my isms if you like as a composer so you know because there'll be something in in all the pieces I've written like that is recognizably something that I I would I would perhaps do as a composer you know and they so they'd be used to doing certain things and um yeah my little compositional surprises will be like things that they're like oh you've done that thing that you often do you know so they they know it well so maybe in that sense it's not so hard to memorize because they're they're also like monster musicians you know like they've got like they're just like music is such a natural way to be for these people that you know putting like something complex in front of them is fine yeah. yeah, the way you work together, there's a sense of evolution that you've all been part of that, which maybe that's why you're called Dinosaur. <laughs> oh, yeah. And as well, it goes without saying, I'm so influenced by those music, those people, you yeah. know, as writers and play, like, improvise, like improvisation-wise and composition-wise, and also our shared listening we do on car journeys. Um, if I hear something that I just think, you know, a friend of mine will really love, I will send it to them on my phone or whatever a little link and yeah so there's all this shared listening and we've discovered music together and showed each other music so that ties in really nicely with the way that you work with the young musicians at NYJC that's something that I've noticed of you is that you're very you're very aware of each individual that you ever work with and you 
you've, you're very quick to, to see what it is that they enjoy doing or where their particular interests lie. And, and the way you teach things, you do it in a very, you know, it gradually unfolds so that you don't suddenly th throw a whole load of information at them, but they can do it in a very evolved, natural way. So that everyone always feels at ease. I've noticed that a lot in whatever environment we're at, we're in, that the musicians, when you're in a leadership position, everybody continues to achieve a large amount but always stays feeling at ease. And I just wanted to nice. that. <laughs> Thank you. But yeah, you see that, that you see that it pays off, you know, and, and so I'm just wondering about the youngsters that you work with and what, what you get out of, what you feel you bring and what you feel you get out of working with the youngsters, because it's clearly something that you really enjoy doing and they love working with you. Yeah, I think I just like, again, just try to think of it like, they're just like other humans like me and to trust, trust the art of communication and like trust, like, like social skills don't have, for me, don't need to change whether I'm talking to, maybe they do a bit. I was going to say whether I'm talking to my mum or whether I'm talking to a student, they probably do a bit. My mum's watching, she'd agree. But, um, <laughs> but um <laughs> she's gonna comment or something now but um yeah I, I I think yeah I actually yeah I like that as a thing like if you're talking to a stranger if you're talking to somebody that you've known for years if you're talking to a nine-year-old if you're talking to a 15-year-old if you're talking to an eight-year-old it's like finding like this just trusting that the person on the receiving end like I, I also I think pacing and time is a big thing in, in this because I think often people feel like like leaving a bit of silence or just letting something slowly unravel will be socially awkward <laughs> but I actually don't think it is at all as awkward as because all these slow moments all these pauses or time to think or speaking a bit slower to make sure that everyone understands actually doesn't go on as long as it might feel for someone who is perhaps feeling a bit anxious about that so I think because I've generally I'm quite calm about speaking slowly and and as you say as we found out my vocabulary is quite small so we have to <laughs> in the English language so you know just using actually the zoom thing's been really good because you have to especially teaching in group, I think I'm having to condense what explain things as clearly with as few words as possible, especially when you're under time pressure, like, you know, in a, in a room in an afternoon in King's Place, there might be a lot of more space for waffle, you know, lots of in between waffle, blah, blah, blah. But um, <laughs> in these online Zoom things, it's like, no, it's maybe a little bit of waffle is okay from time to time, because that's human beings need a bit of that. But actually just being very clear and calm about what you want to say is like a fun little thing that is more important when you're online teaching I think than it is in real life but it's also good in real life but um yeah it'll be interesting to see what, what it's like when we uh, come back together again in person and I have to say Laura as we wrap up now I can't wait to see you I cannot wait to see you and I can't wait to work so with kind. you again <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's been fun. part of you know since we met in 2007 and I really want to thank you from all our different in involvements you know you've made my life as a musician such fun and also oh, it, you. you know it's been so genuine in everything that we've shared so whether we're online or off <laughs> I'm really looking forward to seeing you again lovey oh and thank you thank you so much for talking to me today it's been great to have the opportunity to look back and also look at the different projects I want to congratulate you on all you've achieved the awards that you've had and uh, and you deserve every single bit of uh, acknowledgement because you work hard but with such genuine continued excitement and enthusiasm and I'm looking forward I've really enjoyed the album it's really great and I'm looking forward to sharing that over the summer hopefully we can work with some of the young musicians and maybe look at some of the repertoire together because I think they would love to do that too so for now lovey thank you so much and have a great, great evening and next week as you know who are you talking to next week oh well I'm excited for next week's episode because <laughs> you'll be talking to the fantastic British composers and instrumentalists Mark Lockhart and Nikki Isles who we can agree are absolute uh, jazz royalty here in the UK <laughs> So, and as you said, maybe you'll come back and do some of the interviewing later on in the series as well. So, yeah, that would be fun. Yeah. That.
That'd be great. So have a lovely evening and thanks to everybody that's been listening. This will be on uh, YouTube as well. So anyone that wants to catch up, pass it on and we'll see you next week. And if you'd like to donate, I think there are some little links at the bottom to help us support those young musicians who particularly can't access our work because of financial um, obstacles. So we're really keen to work with everybody that's genuinely got the same love that we've all got for this music and for the people that play the music. It's really important for